In this video for my professional responsibility class, we're going to continue talking about conflicts of interest and specifically um, the comments to model rule 1.7 that pertain to clients who become directly adverse. So having um, introduced it, let's uh, go to my slides and talk a little bit um, uh, and begin to explore this issue with the comments. So comment six to rule 1.7, um, explains that loyalty to a current client prohibits undertaking the representation directly adverse to that client without the first client's informed consent, actually without both clients' informed consent. So this means, or thus, absent cons consent, a lawyer may not act as an advocate in one matter against a person the lawyer represents in some other matter, even when the matters are wholly unrelated. In other words, you represent client A, we've talked about this in other videos, um, drafting their will or something like that. Client B got an offender bender with them and wants to sue client A. Even if you're not representing client A and the offender bender, you represent them on an unrelated matter. You can't take a case that is suing one of your own clients, um, even if that client is going to get a different lawyer um, for this particular case, unless for some reason they both consent. The client as to whom the representation is directly adverse is likely to feel betrayed. And the resulting damage to the client lawyer relationship is likely to impair the lawyer's ability to represent the client effectively. So when I was making these slides years ago, I um, uh, wanted to include an image for betrayal. So I did a Google image uh, search for betrayal or betrayed to see the face of a betrayed client. And uh, the first one that comes up is Meg Ryan. I'm not a fan of Meg Ryan. I don't know what movie this is from, but that's kind of how your client is gonna look at you when they find out that you are suing them on behalf of another client in an unrelated matter. They're gonna say, give me a break and it's gonna be a big breach in trust. And so um, if the words don't stick with you from this lecture, I hope that um, later on when you're starting to rationalize, well, maybe I could take this case that you will see Meg Ryan's face looking at you like you've gotta be kidding me. Um, how could you do this? This is the face of betrayal and you don't want your client to feel like that. Okay, um, now similarly, a directly adverse conflict may arise when a lawyer is required to cross-examine a client who appears as a witness in a lawsuit involving another client, as when the testimony will be damaging to the client who is represented in the lawsuit. So let's say that you've been representing Greenacre for a long time doing their kind of small business work, um, uh, legal work. Uh, uh, Greenacre is a small business owner. You review their vendor contracts and leases and things like that. And you do their legal work and you have a happy relationship with them. And someday a, a new client, Redacre, comes into your office and says, um, I have a case and you're doing your conflicts check. So you say, okay, who are you suing? And they say conglomerate corporation. And you think to yourself, good, I've never heard of that. And so um, that I don't have a conflict of interest. But the problem is that Greenacre was, um, is a necessary witness for conglomerate. So they were present in the room when the contract was negotiated or were an eyewitness of the accident or they're a former employee or for some reason they have invaluable knowledge and they are going to be called to testify on behalf of the opposing party. This means if the case goes to trial, you are going to have to cross-examine Greenacre, um, even though you have no le the, your representation of them is on something totally different. You, you, rep you review their vendor agreements and leases and so forth, and you're gonna have to do that. So I wanna, uh, you'd think about it uh, for a moment. Here's the question. What is your job when you do cross-examination as a lawyer? If you're a litigator, you should know this if you're a law student. Um, if you are cross-examining someone, what is your job? And in a live class, my students will start saying something like impeachment, or you're, you're supposed to impeach. And we don't mean in the sense of like a president, we mean that you are undermining their credibility of that witness. Why? Because they're testifying against the person that you're representing, right? It's a hostile witness, it's a witness for the other side. And so now hopefully you know that when you get to trial, you're never supposed to ask a question you don't already know the answer to, right? So you're not supposed to, you shouldn't be on a fishing expedition. You should have um, try, been doing your discovery in depositions before the trial. When you get to trial and you're cross-examining a witness, 
your you have one job which is to make them look either like a liar or like they're really dumb like they're just too unreliable uh, they contradict themselves they don't make any sense they have a terrible memory or something like that so um either way nobody likes to be made to look like that in in, in public and if you're really good you're going to make them look like a dumb liar right like somebody who um is uh, untruthful and even if they wanted to tell the truth um, is probably all mixed up or it doesn't get their facts straight or doesn't understand how anything works and so forth. And so, so I want you to think for a moment, you've been doing legal work for years for Greenacre and then one day there's Greenacre sitting on the stand and it's your job to destroy them in cross-examination, basically make them seem like a liar and complete and um, absent-minded and forgetful and contradictory and, and, and kind of dumb and, and so forth and make them look really foolish and reprehensible um, in public. Well, they're going to look at you like Meg Ryan, right? And so they're going to be like, what are you doing? You're my lawyer and you're, you're humiliating me. And the better you are at cross, the more that person is going to let you should, the person you cross examine is going to run out of the, the courtroom like crying or, or feeling humiliated. I'm sorry, that's the job right, when you're doing cross is to make them seem untruthful or unreliable. And so if you're doing that, and the person you're doing that to is your own client, it's kind of reasonable for them to resent you for it and to feel like, again, to feel betrayed. I hope you can see the implications of this comment are that you need to ask a lot of questions when you're screening for conflicts. You're, you need to know not just who's being sued and what happened and who's going to pay me and so, as the lawyer and so forth. You kind of need early on in the representation to check for who's likely to be a critical witness in the case. Why? Because if you're going to have to cross-examine one of your own clients, you have a conflict and you shouldn't be doing the case. Okay, what about economic rivals? So uh, let's say you, re you represent two clients and on unrelated matters, and they're only economically adverse, like competing economic enterprises and unrelated litigation. Normally that is not a conflict of interest. And so I'm gonna give you an example. I live in Kingwood, Texas. Um, about 20 minutes away from me is Atascacita, Texas. And in Atascacita, there is a Chipotle restaurant that's directly across the street from an Uberito. And so, and are they business uh, uh, rivals? Absolutely. I remember when the Chipotle was being built, the Uberito was there first and they were not happy about it. And so, uh, so I want you to think about like, if you're, if you have a niche practice, you represent burrito makers. And so can you as a lawyer represent um, Uberito and um, Chipotle and Freebirds and Bullritos, right? All these chains that compete with each other, even though they each consider the other the enemy. Yes, of course, you can. Not if they're suing each other, but just the fact that they happen to be rival businesses doesn't mean you have a conflict of interest. Here's another example. Suppose that there are two or three um, law schools in the same town, in the same big city. And now, they're likely to be crosstown rivals, right? So the stu the, they vie for the best students, the students play their, uh, uh, enrolling students or applying students play their offers off of each other. Um, their graduates compete for jobs. They, the two schools, are, uh, two or three schools are likely to kind of be competitive about their bar pass rates, all sorts of things. If, so let's say you have law school A and law school B in the same city, which we do in my city. And um, we also have law school C, could you do legal work for each of them? Sure. Now, let's say that there's litigation erupts between two of these schools over something that one of them allegedly did to the other. Obviously, now you have a conflict, right? Because they're directly adverse. But just the mere fact that they're competing um, does not create a conflict of interest for you. It could create a material limitation. For example, if you are sort of dependent, your business is dependent on one of them, and they're unhappy with you that you're representing their business rival. So directly, now keep in mind that directly adverse uh, conflicts can arise in transactional matters. And so let's say you're offered, you are asked to represent the um, seller of a business in negotiations with a buyer who's also represented by the lawyer. Not in the same transaction, but in another unrelated matter. 
and the lawyer could not undertake the representation without informed consent from each client. So again, just to, uh, to think about it, when if you have a transactional case and it, it's a commercial real estate deal or we're selling a business or a piece of property or a piece of equipment or something like that, what does, and you as the lawyer are supposed to be negotiating and hammering out the deals, what does the seller want? Well, obviously the seller wants to get the highest price possible. Now, um, and now what does the buyer want? The buyer is hoping for the lowest price possible or the best deal or the most stuff to be thrown in for that price. They want the best deal possible. How could you argue for both at once? Right, you can't. So obviously in the transaction, you can't argue for the seller and the buyer in the same negotiation, trying to get the price up and then you're gonna, what? Are you gonna move to the other side of the table and say, no, 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 the price has gotta be lower. We're only paying half of that. And then walk to the other side of the table and say, uh, forget it then, we need a lot more than that. It's worth so much more. You can't do that. But also let's say you're representing um, one of the parties and just the other one is your client on an unrelated matter. Either, either the client on the unrelated matter is going to resent you for um, trying to get a better deal for someone else than you're getting for them, or the client you're representing in that transaction is going to suspect that you're not trying hard enough, and maybe you're not, right? That you're not trying hard enough to get them a great deal because the other party is also your client and you don't want to offend them. And so this is a transactional conflict when you have the seller and the buyer and they're both your clients and maybe you're only representing one of them in this transaction, but you represent the other one on other matters. Even so, there's a chance one of them is gonna think you're not trying hard enough and the other one is gonna think you're trying too hard or driving too hard of a bargain and you're gonna have a, a conflict. Um, keep in mind though, the transaction, and we're going to say this, talk about this later on. We usually uh, frame, uh, normally frame transactional conflicts in, in sort of our material limitation category, where we're worried that you are a little bit biased or favoring one side or the other. But we do, uh, the ABA wants you to recognize that in transactions, it, they're still adversarial, right? The two parties are kind of dividing up a pie. And if one side gets more, the other side gets less. And so, um, so we have to, in terms of the higher price, the lower price, um, more for the money, less for the money, and, and so forth. So keep that in mind that you can have directly adverse situations in transactional matters. Um, and so we have a case, here's a case from Iowa from 1999. Um, uh, the same lawyer can't represent both the buyer and the seller in a residential real estate transaction. Um, and then the comment I just made, outside the litigation context, the lawyer is far more likely to encounter material limitation conflicts under what rule 1.7A2, discussed um, more below in the comments, than direct adversity conflicts under 1.7A1. Okay, and that ends uh, this video lecture about conflicts of interest.